If you have a Bible or, or maybe a Bible app on your phone, uh, reach for it and turn with me to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, and I'm going to start in verse 12 here in just a moment. And I, I got a brand new message from a wild story in the Bible. It is wild. If you got your kids still in here, maybe take advantage of our kids' ministry today because it ain't PG, okay? But it is a wild story in the Bible, and, and I doubt you've ever heard a message on it before. But Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Judges is the seventh book in the Bible. Uh, Joshua comes right before it, if you're kind of brand new to things and should be able to find it there. But Judges chapter 3, if you don't have a Bible, it'd be on the screen in the room and online. And, and normally I read out the NIV the New International Version. But today I'm using a different translation, the New Living Translation. But even if you got something different, you should be able to follow along with me. And, and of course, keep it open all service long. We, we like to take notes in this church and make sure that we're leaning in. Judges chapter three, starting in verse 12, it says this. Once again, someone shout again. Once again, the Israelites, that's God's people, they did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon, that's the evil king of Moab, control over Israel because of their evil. King Eglon, the evil one, he enlisted the Ammonites and the Malachites and all, all the ites as allies. And then they went out and they defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. This is kind of like the Palm Springs of like that Bible time. They took that over and the Israelites had to serve King Eglon of Moab for 18 years. I, I love the Lord of the Rings names in the Bible. Got evil King Eglon. Verse 13, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again, somebody shout again. The Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, which just spoiler alert, I, I'm going to butcher his name. He's our main character. I'm going to butcher his name all service long. I'm going to call him Ehud, Ehud, like, like E-man. I'm going to call him all kinds of stuff, okay? So just get ready for it. But Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man, the tribe of Benjamin, the Israelites, they sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long. He strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden other, under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. Like, let's just say it like it is what it is. If the Bible calls you overweight, like there's an issue, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't know what goes on in your mind, um, but, but when I read that, I picture like Jabba the Hutt from Star Wars, you know, like just, just there, like just this evil king and you're so holy, you probably don't think that, but that's what I think of, job of the, verse 18. After delivering the payment, the tribute, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back, came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to King Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. King Eglon rose from a seat. Ehud reached with his left hand and pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. I told y'all some James Bond stuff up in the Bible. Now don't close it. We're gonna read a little bit more here towards the end of the service. It gets even wilder, but let's pause there for a moment and let's pray. Would you close your eyes with me? Lord, thank you for your word. Your word's awesome. It's exciting. It's not boring. I pray, God, that we would read it more. I pray, God, that we would lean into it more. I pray, God, there would be a holy expectation every time we open up the word of God that is living, active, and powerful. And so I pray for the seasoned saint and the first-time person and everywhere in between. I pray for all of us, God, that we would learn something or relearn something. There'd be one thought, one idea, maybe even something I don't preach, but Holy Spirit, you are so faithful to take us somewhere else in our mind that leads us to the exact thought or idea or word that we need in this moment in time. So speak what you wanna speak, God, and may we lean into your word with that holy expectation. We love you and we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, I, I wonder, and I was thinking about this recently, but I wonder 
Have you ever had something happen in your life that didn't go exactly according to how you planned it? I want you to think about something. Like, like, like you, you planned it one way, oh, it was gonna be good, but it didn't turn out just like you thought it would. If you, if you can't think of anything, um, I got lots of examples, but I just wanna give you, give you one. Uh, I'll never forget this. My wife, Isabel, will never forget this either. Um, but we led different mission trips uh, from Dallas, where we're from, uh, different teenagers and young adults. And we went place, different places in the United States. We, we went to El Salvador three different times. And I think it was our last trip to El Salvador. And we got about 20 teenagers there, uh, young adults. And they had raised thousands of dollars not to, to get a PS5 or and all the games or not a new computer or any kind of that. No, no, no. They raised all this money to go tell people about Jesus. And by the way, we're gonna be doing mission trips here and not just for young people, but all people. And so we're always so excited going in. We got these expectations in our mind. And, and here's how I lead mission trips is if it's a week long, we'll normally do six days of ministry. And then the last day will be like a fun day. But it's following the principles of God, right? It should be that way in your life. You don't work seven days, you work six days. And then on the seventh day, you should rest. And all God people said, amen, right? Like that should be what we do. And so, so that's, that's, that's our heart. And so uh, my staff and uh, my interns, we, we came up with the plan uh, of what we we're gonna do on that, that last day. And it was gonna be amazing. We had planned to go kind of on a uh, water excursion, if you will, and to see all these different tropical fish. Like, like we literally had this expectation in our mind that we were gonna find Nemo and find Dory and all their friends, okay? That was the mindset. And I'll never forget this, you won't either, but we pull up in our bus without air conditioning. We pull up in our bus to the shores of El Salvador where my wife's mom is from. And there, there was no grand boat. There were all these little sh tiny like shipping like vessels. I don't even know what you call them. Like, a, is it a skiff a word? I don't know, just something real, real small that were not meant for this. We, we were thinking in our minds, did they steal these? Like what's, what's going on? So we load all these teenagers and young adults. Man, it wasn't funny then, but it's funny now. And we load all these teenagers in here and we set off from the shores of El Salvador into the water and we are fighting gigantic waves. Again, we're in boats that you ain't supposed to be in for this kind of thing. And remember, I'm responsible for all these teenagers. Like mom and dad, you, you would expect, what you should expect that I would get them home safely, right? And so we're there and we're hitting these waves and literally everybody's getting sick like real sick, I mean, multiple people are throwing up. It was supposed to be fun, but it wasn't fun. I remember myself, like I was right on the edge, but at the time I had a streak going and it had been over 10 years since I'd ever thrown up. So I was really trying to keep my streak. Now I broke that recently. We had something go through our family like the plague about a year ago, but, but still at that point I was on the edge and <laughs> it was just ridiculous. So, so our, our tour guides, I say that very loosely and with air quotes, like tour guides. Uh, we weren't seeing anything. We were just seeing throw up, you know, as we passed it by. And so <laughs> one of the tour guys, like they, they saw a dead fish floating on the top of the water. God is my witness. You could make it up, but it wouldn't be as good. He pulled all of us up to the side of this dead fish, picked it up, remember this Isabel? Picked it up and held it up like a trophy fish for us all to see. And it was like a normal fish, it was just dead. The only other, literally, the only other thing that we saw was these two giant sea turtles. He pulled all, oh, you're not gonna awe here in a second. Pulled up to them. Remember, I got all these teenagers. We're on a holy mission for God. And these two giant sea turtles, I'll say it to you this way, they are having relations. It's funny now, it wasn't funny then. I'm thinking I am gonna get so many calls. <laughs> like it was bad, it gets worse. We get back to the shore, we get in that bus without air conditioning in the middle of El Salvador in the middle of July. You think it's hot in Houston and it is, it's way hotter in El Salvador and especially even humid. You wouldn't think we can get more than 100%. Apparently you can get more than 100% humidity. And it is, it's so bad and, and we are stuck in traffic for hours. Uh, we feel like we're about to die. And then to make matters the most worse, like one of our students could not hold it anymore, had to use the restroom in the back of a bus in a bucket. You're welcome, kids. We come again on a mission trip. 
I say all that to say this. Sometimes things in life don't go according to plan. They happen differently than how you planned it. And, and honestly, this is where the people of God are in the book of Judges. The people of God, again, they are the Israelites. And just to give you very, very high level, because I'm not gonna assume that you all know your Bible cover to cover, but the people of God, the Israelites, just prior to this, they had been delivered out of slavery in Egypt. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you know that story, the whole Pharaoh let my people go, and Moses is the man for the job there and leads them out. But not only that, there was this guy named Joshua, the next man up. Remember, that's the name of the book before Judges. And you've got Joshua, and he actually leads God's people into the promised land. And all that's great, but then you have the book of Judges, where God's people, they start what scholars have called sin cycles, where they, because things are going so good that they forget God. How I many y'all know that's still happening today? When you're at the end of your rope where there's like no more rope, then you cry out to God. But when things are good, you're on that high mountain, like sometimes you can't forget God. So they go through these cycles and we're kind of at the beginning of these cycles of where I love God, I love him not. I'll serve God, I'll serve him not. And in these lowest of lows, they would cry out to God as we read and God in his kindness and his faithfulness, he would Forgive, And aren't you so thankful, like we said last week, that we serve a God of second chances. He didn't rub their face in it. He is faithful to forgive. And so they would cry out to God and then God every single time would raise up a judge or you could say a deliverer like Ehud. Raise up a man of God to break the cycle. And I'm just believing. In fact, I'm speaking prophetically over this service over many men of God and women of God in this service, that you would be raised up by God to be a cycle breaker in your family. That even if there's some family history and some baggage and some stuff that you've been through, maybe even some, some mistakes that you've done, that God would raise you up. Is anybody receiving this right now? That I'm gonna break the cycle in Jesus' name and I'm gonna repent and I'm gonna get things back right with God. So you've got this guy named Ehud and he is the deliverer. And, and as we read in Judges chapter three, I look at it again, if you kept it open, he's the man that his job is to bring tribute to the king. Now this sounds weird because remember King Eglon and the Moabites, they're the ones that conquered Israel. They're the ones that have made Israel slaves for 18 years. But that was the custom back then that kind of on the anniversary of you being overtaken, that somebody, which you wouldn't want that job, but somebody would have to bring payment or a tribute to the king saying, thank you for enslaving us. Sounds ridiculous, but that's what would happen. But I love this, that Ehud, he, he has a God moment. And again, I'm believing that for many of you. He's got a God moment. And he's like, you know what? God hasn't called us to just like submit to this horrible thing and be slaves again. God's got plans for us, but we turned our back on him. God wants to do something in us again. Here's the God moment. He's like, why are we feeding what we should be fighting? Why, why are we paying homage? Why, 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 why are we, it's like, no, 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 we should be pronouncing war. What are we doing? And so God gives him this like secret spy plan as we read and it's so incredible but there's some details that we gotta highlight, that we gotta circle. There's some details here. And, and pro tip, by the way, if anything's in the Bible, just assume it's there on purpose because it is. So some of those details, you're like, why do we have to know like, how heavy you know, that guy is? Why do we have to know that he was left-handed? Every detail matters. It's in there for a reason. Remember, the Bible says Ehud is left-handed. That can seem random, but it's, no, nah, you see, back in Bible times, similar to today's culture, in fact, but back in Bible times, it was very rare to have your left hand be your dominant hand. It was even more rare back then, in fact, because if you were left-handed, you tried anything you could 
to become a right-hander. In fact, I just want to ask, who's left-handed in the room? Would you raise it up? Okay, awesome. That fits our numbers, about 10% of the U.S., the population. And how many of y'all know when somebody's left-handed, they're always proud of it, you know? In first service, like, we had people cheering and shouting, yeah, I'm left-handed. But but being left-handed, not only was it rarer than it even is today back then, but also, and this is different, being a left-hander back then, people saw it as a physical defect, So they saw it like, hey, something's wrong with you. It shouldn't be this way. It was something that was belittled, mocked, made fun of. It was something that you definitely wouldn't be proud of. And again, the Bible tells us that Ehud, he was left-handed. Here's what blew my mind. I've read the Bible a whole bunch of times, but I had never known this until I studied this past week. Not only was Ehud a left-hander in a right-handed world, he was a Southpaw, Not only is that true, but his tribe, his family, Benjamin, Benjamites, here's what that means. Son of the right hand. Does that not blow your mind? So you've got Ehud, he's a left-hander in a right-handed world. He has mocked his entire life. He never fits in. Something to be embarrassed about back then. But not only that, he's a left-hander in a family and their last name means (laughs) right-hander. That's tough. That's not easy. That's who he was, a left-handed man in a family called the right-handers, a guy who's looked down on his entire life, doesn't fit in, last pick, doesn't belong. I wonder if God's speaking to anybody right now and you feel like that's your story. But what's so great about Ehud and every story in the Bible is that God takes great joy. I hope you're hearing me today. God takes great joy in using outcasts, great joy in taking people that other people would dismiss and mock and belittle. God takes great pleasure in using people that no one else would pick. Why? Because it shows his glory. God loves using those that everybody else would skip over. I'll say it to you this way. It's my sermon in a sentence. God specializes in turning your weakness into your weapon. I'm gonna say it again. This is a word for so many of you. God specializes in turning your weakness into your weapon. He's left-handed. In a right-handed world, even the name of his family is right-handers. And he's this guy that has the job that nobody would want to take tribute to this evil king, Jabba the Hutt wannabe. But he has this God moment. Why are we feeding that which we should be fighting? Why are we okay with slavery? God has more for us if we would just repent and turn back to him. And so he actually works his weakness because the majority of people were right-handers especially which by the way uh, the tribe of Benjamin were the warriors eventually they would later on raise up a whole army of left-handers but this is not that point yet and so as he goes there they're not expecting a lefty they're expecting a righty here's what I mean Um, the secret service of the king just like you would have today if you go to see a president or a king or queen or whatever Uh, They would frisk you before you went in to see him. They were looking for weapons and making sure that you didn't have anything to try to attack back. But here's what's so cool about this is because all the warriors, especially, and most of the people were right-handed and because they would have their dagger, anything hidden on their left side, that they would not typically frisk the right side of people's body where a lefty would reach, but they would frisk like the, the normal side, the left side of the body. What do you mean, pastor? That's how he snuck through security. That's how he got in. God designed it that way. Because here's why, some of you wonder, why why is that? If you got a knife, if you're right-handed like I am, and you got a knife on your right side, yeah, you can pull it, but that's an awkward motion, right? You're wasting a movement. Not only do you have to pull it out, but then you've got to put it forward. If, if, If you're a righty and you got the sword or the dagger on your left thigh, then not only do you pull it out, but you can swipe at the same time. That makes sense to everybody? And so lefty going to the right leg and righty going left leg, but, but they wouldn't frisk every part. They didn't have time for that. They just frisked one side. So he snuck back past security. Again, you got to work your weakness. Not only that, 
But, but when he was alone with the king, if Ehud would have reached with his right hand for anything, he could have been scratching his head. But any movement with his right hand that was crazy or aggressive, the king would have sounded the alarm. He would have known that something's about to go down. But when Ehud reached with his left hand, he didn't think anything of it. And God was able to use him. Some of you need to receive this deep down soul level, your weakness. God wants to turn it into a weapon for his glory. The story gets better though. I can't wait to read some more with you. Turn with me, or if you're already there, just the next verse. Judges chapter three, verse 22. We pick up where we left off. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. Don't be mad at me, it's what the Bible says. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger. He's like, I can't find it, okay? Like, I can't. And the king's bowels emptied. I won't say anything, you know what that means. Verse 23. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room. We gotta turn this into a movie, y'all. Like this, at least like a, a short mini series, like on Amazon Prime. This is so good. Closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the latrine. You know what that is? After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and they found the door. I just think this is hilarious. They found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room. He might be using the restroom. You can say it this way. He's not on his real throne. He's on the porcelain throne, okay? Nobody laughed in first service either. Okay, I tried it. I tried. (laughs) I think it's hilarious, but verse 25. So they waited. They're checking their watches. Well, they didn't have, they're they're checking their sundials. They're like waiting. He's been in there. He's been in a long time, hasn't he? Should we go in? No, no, he's just on the porcelain throne. No, 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 go in. Are you, are you sure it's, it's been like 30 sundials, you know? Like, are you sure? Oh, no, he had bad, you know, meat last night. Like, he, he's large, you know? So, like, they're waiting. But when they, I just think this is funny. When the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned. They're like, this is not normal. And they got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found their master dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passed by the stone idols on his way to Sarah. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. So here's what he's doing. Hey, the king is dead. It is time to attack. This is that William Wallace moment, okay? Like this is that rah, rah speech. Like like this this is our moment. We don't wanna be in slavery. God has so much more for us. This is the left-hander. Y'all with me? This is the guy, nobody wanted anything to do with him. And now he's leading the battle. Sounded a call to arms. Led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord. I love this courage and this prophetic word. For the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. That will preach itself right there, but, or I'd love to preach on that more, but I don't have time. Crossing the Jordan. Verse 29, they they attacked the Moabites, killed about 10,000. Remember, these are evil, evil people. About 10,000 of their strongest and most able body warriors. Not one of them escaped. Notice this last verse. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. That is very, very important. Remember how long they were in slavery to Moab? 18 years. Not only did God multiply that way over, but 80 years, scholars and historians will tell you this, 80 years during this time of judges was the longest span of peace for Israel, God's people multi-generational peace, 80 years. And so again, I speak prophetically over men and women of God in this service, that I don't care how long you or your family has been in bondage. May you have been feeding what you should have been fighting. You've been coping with it. Well, at least I'm not as bad as I used to be, or at least I'm not as bad as my mom was or my dad was. And I speak prophetic, prophetically over you, man and woman of God that you would be a cycle breaker, not just for you in this generation, 
but for generations in Jesus name that even if you come from a line of infidelity in marriage that you would be the one the cycle breaker that I'm gonna hold true to my marriage vows even when especially when it's not easy that even if you come from a long line of addiction substance abuse they say you know what God is calling me to be raised up to be the deliverer for my family and for future generations that I will walk in freedom because of Jesus I'm gonna break the cycle I'm gonna break the cycle I'm gonna break the cycle everybody else may have been last pick oh, I don't want him I don't want her you are God's first draft choice he's picking you number one overall he wants you not anybody else why because it reveals his glory because when people see hey God used him God used her God used this guy named Ryan from Dallas he got a lot of issues when people see that they're like wow God must be real because if he can work through them and not a king or queen if he can do that he can do anything like all the disciples, men and women of God, cover to cover, Old Testament, New Testament, and you will find men and women with weakness, with insufficiencies that are not enough, but they leaned in and they lifted up their hands and their eyes to Jesus, said, Jesus, you are more than enough. And the weakness that I have, the struggle that maybe I'm in, you'll turn it into a testimony, into a weapon. Now, please know this, and then I'm gonna pray. We did a whole series on this but we don't live in the old covenant anymore. We live in the new covenants. So we're not talking about physical war or physical battles. I, I'm, I'm not saying, God's not saying you do this. We don't fight spiritual battles with physical weapons. We wage war in the spirit. We pray it through, we declare God's word. We declare the name of Jesus. We fight it in the spiritual. Remember our enemy is not flesh and blood with skin on it. Our enemy is the devil and his demons. That's who we declare war on. And we're gonna deliver, not just our families, but it's gonna affect future generations as we repent and we say, God, please forgive us. May we break the cycle. Would you bow your head, close your eyes. Jesus, raise us up, judges, men and women to deliver their family and their family's family, friends, the city, our nation, to break the cycle, break the cycle. I pray God, as we repent and we turn away from our evil ways and turn back to you, I pray God that your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy would flow. I pray God that you would give us a fresh start with you. We'll do what we need to do in the natural. There's some of us need to see a therapist and, and need to get rid of stuff that's just a temptation. Yeah, we do this stuff in the natural. We need to do absolutely. But we trust you more than anything in the supernatural to break the bonds, to break off the shackles. May cycle breakers, deliverers raise up, rise up in this church, in this service to declare we are not ever again gonna turn our back on God that we're gonna break the cycle, we're gonna repent. God's gonna heal us. God's gonna provide and make a way where there seems to be no way. God, if you can use Ehud, you can use any one of us. No matter the weakness, no matter the past, no matter the struggle, you take great joy, you specialize in turning all that around for good, of using what others would mock and belittle to use it in big ways. May people see your glory in and through us. And I pray lastly for anybody in this service. God, we had so many people this last Sunday and even on Wednesday that gave their life to you. I pray God this Sunday, whether it's live in the room or online or later on on YouTube on demand, I pray God for anybody that's far from you that today would be their day to repent, to turn away from evil and turn back towards you. That's what repentance means, by the way. That we would humble ourselves before a mighty, awesome, loving, forgiving God and ask you to save us, to heal us, to set us free. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you can do that right now. You can just whisper to him, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe you died on the cross. We talked about that during communion. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the dead, 
And I ask you to save me, to forgive me of all my sin, to clean me up from the inside out, to break the cycle. I don't wanna sin against you anymore. And that's what sin is, God. It separates me from you. I don't wanna sin against you. I don't wanna put up those walls anymore. May you break them all down. May you heal me, forgive me, set me free. Rescue me, God. Thank you for your kindness that you don't rub my nose in the mess that I've made. But when I come to you, humble, in need of help, your word says again, (laughs) thank you God, again, that you would forgive, again, that you would set me free, again, you would give me a brand new start. Thank you God for your grace. Thank you God for lives that are being changed, not by a message or a church, not by a service, by you. You're the only one that changes us. You're the only one, the only one. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in this service and every service. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCove.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCove.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.